who was God's mother? Because she said they were talking about mothers and, and she said that Anita had said, if Mary was the mother of Jesus, then who was the mother of God? Now, isn't that a, a wonderful, wonderful question? And Anita, when you're watching this, I was so proud of that question that you asked because it shows that you want to understand more about God. And what a wonderful question. But you know, God doesn't have a mother because he is the beginning and he is the end. He is the alpha and he is the omega. And so we cannot even understand. It's beyond our human comprehension because he is the beginning and the end. But well done, Anita, for asking that question. And just as we close this psalm, I'm going to skip over um, just a few verses there and over to verse 23 of Psalm 139. It says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, God sees our heart. He sees any anxiety, any fears that we may have. You know, but if we cry out to him for help, then he will help us to overcome those things. As we've read in that psalm, he is there during the night, during the day, before us, behind us, surrounding us. How amazing. How amazing is that? But it's saying there that it says, if there's any offensive way in me, show me, show me, Lord. And don't you think that over the last three weeks, when I think about that analogy of the guttering again, God has been saying about, you know, clearing the blockage, clear the blockage that is in the guttering so that the water, the life, the spirit of God can flow through. So I'm going to leave that with you. But as uh, just before I pass over to Brian to minister the word, um, I just want to remind you that this week um, we are launching the weekly thought. Um, now, I did say that the link was going to go out on Monday, forgetting that it was bank holiday on Monday. Um, so um, I won't be at work. So the link will go out on Tuesday, um, which means that you will receive a link um, of the video recording of the weekly thought. Now, I know that we sent that out in paper format or electronically on Thursday, um, but you will receive a video on, uh, on Tuesday morning. Um, then, if you've got any questions, just um, if you want to email them across, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you uh, want to join us, though, for a discussion, a live discussion on Zoom, um, we'll be doing that on Wednesday evening from 7.30 until 9 o'clock. It would be helpful if you've got any questions that you let us know in advance so that we can prepare. Um, it doesn't matter if, if not, but it would be preferable. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you, be it by email or um, you know whatever social media you have. Um, but then, um, if you're able to join us on Wednesday evening from 7.30 till 9, um, we will... Um, <laughs> obviously be able to to try out zoom for the first time so um, look out for the links i'll be sending more information out on tuesday and god bless you and i look forward to seeing you real soon i'm going to hand over to brian now take care bye for now thank you for that maria wow what a what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful promise. What wonderful hope there is in the scriptures. I want us to, to have a look at, I suppose for a title this morning, it would be having our feet on the rock. Having our feet on the rock. I want to read a, a very uh, well-known parable. But I want to link it with something quite different to what it's normally linked with. So stay with me. Luke chapter 6, verse 47 to 49. Everyone who comes to me and continues to listen to my words and practices its teaching, I will show you what I compare them to. They are like someone, when building their house, dig deep in order to lay the foundation on a rock. When the floods came, 
even the vehement beating of the river against the house did not have the power to move it. Wow, I love that version. Because it was founded on a rock. How different it is for those who hear but do not act on it. They are like those that built a house with the foundations just resting on the earth. When the floods came and beat vehemently against the house, it immediately fell, destroying the house. Do you know when I read that, I suddenly had a, an enormous fear that hit me. I thought, wow, we have a 200-year-old building here and the foundations are simply laid right on the earth. I thought, woo! <laughs> but you know, it stood 200 years, just over. But I'm sure you get my meaning. But the scripture I want to link this to, because it is a well-known parable, but the thing that struck me was that Jesus was in the habit of explaining the spiritual truth that lay behind the parable he was giving. He used a natural thing that we were all familiar with in order to explain a spiritual truth behind it. But on this occasion, he didn't. And that got me curious. And so I then began to look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Now, this was a strange church. It was a very mixed up church. It was a very sort of odd type of church. It was involved in a real sense of hype and extremity of spiritual things. Uh, and it had very little depth. But Paul had to write two letters to try to moderate something of what was going on. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, he said this. I do not want you to be ignorant how that the cloud surrounded all our fathers as they passed through the sea. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Every one of them ate the same spiritual meat and drank the same spiritual drink. Now, the word spiritual here can often be translated supernatural. Not sort of hairy, fairy stuff, but supernatural. So we could easily say everyone ate of that supernatural meat, reflecting the time when in the wilderness God fed Israel, his people, with supernatural manna and drank the same supernatural drink. Bear that in mind. Because the next phrase says this, for they drank of that spiritual rock, that supernatural rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Do you know, this is, no wonder the early apostles said of Paul, they said his writings are amazing. They're so incredibly difficult to understand. And aren't they? You have to really delve to understand Paul's writing. And so as we, as we try to make sense of building on a rock, yet we see that Paul linked the rock that was Christ, he linked it to supernatural supernatural drink, supernatural food. And this morning, if we're going to plant our feet on a rock, our hearts have got to be open to the supernatural. We have to move out of the realm of the natural and into the realm of the supernatural. We have to move away from services that are contrived by human ingenuity. And we have to let the Spirit of God once again move in our midst. And if you want the reference that uh, Paul was talking about, when Moses and Israel was led through uh, out of Egypt, across the sea, uh, they were led by a pillar of fire 
and a cloud. You'll find that in Numbers 20, verses 7 to 11. And now, uh, how that uh, God opened up the sea and led them as on dry land. But this actual happening, and I, I remember hearing about the story of, we've heard about one of our really young children there asking that amazing question. Uh, there was a, I heard the story of a Sunday school uh, young lady, young uh, girl that was in a class that were, was taking religious instructions, but the teacher obviously knew nothing about God. And, uh, and so they began to belittle the miracles of God. And they came to this one where Israel walked across the river as though it was dry ground. And they said, of course, it didn't, it wasn't really a miracle because the river was not in the flood. In fact, the depth of water would have only come to your ankles. So it wasn't such a miracle. And then she looked and pointed at this little girl and she said, was it? And you know, oh, bless God for little children, eh? What an amazing question we had through that young life. But the little girl stood up and she said, Miss, no, it's actually a bigger miracle than I thought it was. Are you sure that it was only a few inches deep? And she said, yes. Well, she said, that's amazing because God drowned the whole of the Egyptian army with their horses, with their chariots and everybody in three inches of water. That is amazing. Oh, you know, wouldn't it be good if we could get back to childhood again? But you see, out of this actual happening came a lifelong tradition to the Hebrews. They began to promote what you could easily call folklore or fairy tale. It got exaggerated, it got twisted for whatever reason. And it came out that a large fragment of rock was cut off this big rock there and there were 12 crevices in that rock. And, uh, and that followed them, it, it kind of rolled itself into a mound and it followed them supernaturally everywhere they went. And when they were in need of water, then water came out of these crevices. And so it became exaggerated, it became something that intelligent people would probably look at and say, Do you know, that is a step too far really. But Paul's education at the feet of the renowned uh, Gamaliel, who was renowned as a teacher, who was renowned as a scholar in those days, and, and the wealthy and the intelligent among them would go and be educated by Gamaliel, which Paul was. And so Paul, when he was trying to deal with the problem in the Corinthian church, I don't think for one moment by referring to the rock that followed the children of Israel, I don't think he was trying to support the theory that they had propagated. For whatever reason. Because Paul said so powerfully at the end of that, that rock that followed them was Christ. It was not a fairy story. It was not folklore. It was Christ in all his supernatural power, taking human things and making them supernatural. Was that the reason that Jesus never gave an explanation to that parable? Was it that he didn't have the time to try to defeat and dis uh, destroy the folklore that was hiding the real truth. No, I, I, I don't think that was the case. There was obviously a reason that Jesus didn't want to go into that. But you see, the truth is that when Jesus talked about building a house 
on the rock. He's talking about building it on Christ. He's talking about building it on the supernatural. Because you cannot embrace Christ without embracing something of the supernatural. God never intended the supernatural to be exploited and put into folklore or ridiculed. He expected and wanted and planned for the supernatural to be a part of our life. But what about Peter's very, very powerful revelation of that? Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 16. If you're not a part of a local church today, you should be. And if you think the church is powerless, irrelevant, think again. Jesus said this, when he had come to Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that I the son of man am? They replied saying, you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elias. Others think you're Jeremiah or even one of the prophets. But he then looked at them and said, but who do you say that I am? And so the question about building on a rock, having your feet on the rock, is not to others, it's to you. Where are your feet? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter, the one that always opened his mouth before he realized what he'd said, he immediately replied, and aren't there some people like that? The moment a question is asked, immediately they're in before they've even had chance to finish the question or think about it. But Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. He'd got that one, right? Jesus said to him, Simon Barjona, you are blessed. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father who is in heaven. I'm telling you that you are Peter. Upon this rock, not Peter. Peter is not the rock. His name happened to be a stone. But he said, you are Peter. Upon this rock, the revelation that I am Christ the son of the living God, I will build my church. Wow! I, gosh, forgive me, I want to run. And the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. And so, what is God's plan for the worldwide church? What, what should we be aiming at? We, we want to be looking at life beyond COVID-19. I am not immersed in COVID-19. I'm looking for the day when we are able to get back to building a church as God wants it built. Let me close with something that in connection with this. Many, many years ago, more years than I care to remember. I prefer to think I'm 50. Have been that for a good many years. But many years ago, I received a very, very clear, detailed vision about the... While I was in Denmark on ministry, uh, I received that vision, slain in the Spirit of God for four hours. <clears throat> a very detailed vision. And I saw fires all over Europe that expanded into one flame, one fire, where one didn't end or another begin. But I also saw miracles on a scale, the supernatural on a scale that the world had never witnessed before. The church is not dying. 
the message of Christ is not an irrelevance. Hang around. You're going to see a demonstration of God's power unparalleled in history. But I also saw how the governments would seek to marginalise the relevance of the church. And aren't we seeing that today, especially in our nation? Marginalise the relevance of the church. But I also saw how Satan would change. Now I'm an avid researcher of revivals that have passed. And every single one of them have failed. They stopped, not because God had finished, but because man interfered. Every single one of them without fail. God did not have a time to stop. Man interfered with it. Satan began to bring the church into extremity or compromise. Denying reality of the power of the Spirit or going over the top with the power of the Spirit. But this time he would change his attack. And he would begin to create, mimic the real move of God that is yet to come by human means, by human manipulation. You see, you can be psychosomatic in people's lives. You can control by human things. But the church that Jesus is building I will build my church on this rock, the rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we need more revelation of who Jesus is. It appears that things are already happening in our nation. And we could be excused for thinking that the battle's already lost. But, but. But one thing, Christ is still going to build his church. Nothing, no one can stop that. This was not an idle promise. It did not come from the lips of a human being. It came from the lips of you are Christ, the Son of of the living God. Christ will once again become Lord in our houses. Christ will once again take his rightful place at the heart of our worship, at the heart of our ministry, at the heart of our gathering together. And I'm looking for that day. My encouragement to you as I close now is, is that the kind of church you want to be a part of let's get our eyes off how we can manipulate how we can try to understand you can't intellectually understand the supernatural by its very nature it just happens I've been privileged to be a part of a number of moves of God powerful moves of God in my 50 years of ministry. But what we are about to see will dwarf them all. Let's look forward to that. Let's grab it and go with it. Father, we want to thank you for the hope that is laid before us. We want to thank you for the joy that is laid before us. We want to thank you for what we know you're going to do. And we say amen to it. The Lord bless you. Tune in again next week. Thank you.